everybody. We are here to listen, think about, contemplate, analyze, and if we choose to internalize um, these words, this information, this advice about how, most basic, is about how to know our own mind. Why? Because for the Buddha, what goes on in the mind is the main source of our misery or happiness. And we all want happiness and don't want misery. So, you know. And then putting ourselves together by knowing our own mind and changing it because we're not set in stone. As Lama Zopa says, we can mold our mind into any shape we like. Then on the basis of this, we become more steady, more clear, more relaxed, more easygoing, more fulfilled. So then we can just help others. We live in this world together. And I'll say a little prayer that sort of expresses that. Sangye Chodang Soke Chom Nam La Jan Chul Badu Dagni Kyap Su Chi Dagi Chon Yen Gipe Sonam Ki Droga Penche Sangye Drupa Shol Sangye Chodang Soke Chom Nam La Jan Chul Badu Dagni Kyap Su Chi Dagi Chon Yen Gipe Sonam Ki Droga Penche Sangye Drupa Shol Sangye Chodang Soke Chom Nam La Jan Chul Badu Dagni Kyap Su Chi Dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki, dro la pen che sang gi dro pa sho. So I wonder if anybody has any questions. Get the ball rolling. Any questions? How about you, Eileen? You got some questions lined up today? Always rely on Eileen for questions. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Get us going, Eileen, come on. Happy birthday, Rabina. Happy oh, birthday. Thank you, yes, thank you. Happy so birthday. Happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday, birthday. <laughs> Venerable. Okay. Yeah. I was just talking yeah. to one of my sisters this morning. I was just talking to one of my sisters this morning, and we noted that our mother and father didn't make it to 80. And my oldest sister, our oldest sister Jan, didn't make it to 80. So we figured maybe I'd be ready to go. So one more year to go. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Many more okay. years. Okay. So any questions? I, I I think I think it it it's about uh, learning, you know. For yeah. instance, uh, when you sent all the material uh, about refuge and the Lamarim and uh -huh. so forth, so I find myself reading a lot of different things. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So sometimes it gets a little, I guess, it's here, there, and sometimes I feel um, maybe it's I go in too many different directions. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if you had any advice about. You know, we're drawn to certain things. I mean, but right, I right. mean, it, but you know, reading a lot of different things. So, right. if, so I mean, I don't know what my I guess my question is: how to get more organized I in terms that. of learning. Does that make I sense? Understand. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. So, I suppose it's a, it's a question of how um, how intensively how how focused you want to become in your practice and studies. So, you know, we know there are some people who like to play tennis once a week, and there are some people who want to become like Federer. I mean, maybe in the long term, you all want to become like Federer. So it's a question of other priorities, how much intensively you want to put into it. So, you know, if you want to jump in the deep end and you, you what you would do, like if you were in Tibet, you'd become a monk or a nun, or these days, even, even in Nepal or somewhere, you become a monk or a nun, you go live in the monastery, and then you'd study every day full time. You understand? Yes. That's, that's, that's that level. So that's up to how much. So then the other one is to answer for, for most of us who maybe won't do that, 99% of us won't do that, or even 99.9% 99 .9 of us won't, you know, give up sex, drugs, and rock and roll and go to the mountains and then really focus on doing the job. So the, the other, so the other approach is, to get it when you ha have to have a general sense of the of the um the point of the whole path. It's a path, it's a way, it's a series of steps that you're taking that will end you up in a certain place. So we understand the concept of a path, whether it's a physical road that gets you to somewhere or an internal road. Here's an internal one. So that means there are steps. To, so that means you've got to know where you're going. Isn't it? The first step is you've got to know where you're going, Eileen, isn't it? You've got to know what the goal is, where you're heading, where you're going. So it, it, that's your decision. I mean, you might, some people like to be Buddhist and like to think they just want to become slightly more content, more fulfilled and a bit more useful in their life. Perfectly fine. But if you want to, again, jump in the deep end and take on the Buddhist view, the Mahayana Buddhist view that you're, the goal, the end of the path for you is to become a Buddha, rid the mind of all the rubbish and develop to perfection all the goodness, speaking simply, you know. 
So if, if that's your goal, then clearly there are steps to get there. Well, that's what this packaging called the Lam Rim is all about. Initially, it's a bit abstract for us. We, I mean, when I first heard Lama's over teaching, I had no idea what he meant when he, I started hearing these arcane ideas and thought, what the hell, what am, I supposed to do with, what am I supposed to do with all of this, you know? So if you've got a sense of the Lam Rim, then in fact, do you, Eileen, do you have a sense of what this Lam Rim is? If you don't, just say so. I don't think so. Not really. Well, that would be a good start, sweetheart. Yes. That would be a good start. And then you, what it's doing, what it does is takes the essential points of this Buddhist path that you know you've heard about, karma, impermanence, compassion, mm -hmm. emptiness, bodhicitta, all these concepts, right? They're all terms for certain stages of this path. And they all fit in a certain order. So when you know that structure, when you know that map, and you read about compassion and bodhicitta, you're going to know that's a more advanced level. If you read about impermanence, you're going to know that's right at the beginning level. If you know about karma, you'll know that begins to the beginning level. So you'll know where everything fits. Then even though you might jump from pillar to post, you know what you're doing and where it fits in the big picture. Without that, it's just confusing. Yes. So I'm sure I've sent you, in fact, if you received yes. material from me. Yes. Um, Oh, when I sent you refuge material, yes. I sent you a PDF of that little that PDF. It's called a very simple, you know, a very simple presentation of the path from A yes. to Z. That yes. if you read that and get a sense of that structure, honey, it'll make more sense. Thank you. Because right. you'll read yes. those concepts, you'll know you've heard them before. But yes. that, that entire course, that PDF, is taking all of those concepts and presenting them in this orderly way. Okay, it's simple and down to earth in my language, but it's the structure. And once yes. you get a sense of where you're at, do you understand? Yes, I do. Then I in do. terms of how you internalize that every day, some people like to do, you know, have more of a contemplative, meditative kind of approach and do visualizations and like to recite mantras. Other people like to read the books more and think about it. Mm -hmm. You've got to find your style. Because yes. in, the end, in the end, Eileen, if you jump, if you want to be called labeling yourself a Buddhist, what that does imply, assuming you take that you want the hundred percent of it, you can be a one one percent Buddhist, that's your decision. But if you like the whole picture, then you need what you've got to base. I mean, all Buddha's telling us is one way of putting it. All this presentation is his observations from his own direct experience about how things exist. So this sounds a bit abstract to us, but if we think about it very simply, every human being on the planet, not to mention animals, are all walking around with a series of viewpoints in our head that we use to interpret the world we live in. Now, if you're a typical person who might refer to yourself as a philosoph you know, materialist, philosophical materialist view, you'd say, oh, I don't believe in anything. You know, you religious people over there, you make up all these ideas. Well, I mean, the Buddha says, don't be ridiculous. Everybody's got a bunch of viewpoints. If you're a materialist, you think your mother made you, you think your mind is a brain, you think you came from the monkeys, you think this, you think that, you think you're an innocent victim, you think you're nice to get born. It's an entirely elaborate philosophical view of the world. But because it's so autobiographical, Automatic, then you just think it's just reality but actually it's a series of viewpoints and what buddha's saying is that the viewpoints we have in our mind about ourselves and the world they are the basis of whether you're crazy or sane and happy or suffering Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's an interesting point, you know. So what you're trying to do if you're a Buddhist is, one, you're trying to internalise all these concepts of impermanence, karma, bodhicitta, if you want to, if you choose to, and that takes time, starting with a theory, it's slowly, gradually, you put meat on the bones and it becomes experiential. This is what you're doing is check, reconfiguring the way you interpret the world, basically. Do you see my point? And this is what you're trying to do anyway, right? You listen to it, you think about yes. it, you read it, and that's what you're doing, right? Yes. yes. Well, keep moving keep moving and then learn to see the experiential impact of that. It's not just filling your yeah. head with a bunch of ideas and passing your Buddhist exam and being clever. Uh -huh. and the point of any theory is to turn it into practice. If you just if you just learn a bunch of theories about how to make cakes but never bother to make a cake, you'd be called ridiculous. Mm -hmm. If you, you can learn all the theory of music but never play the piano, it's kind of filling your head with rubbish. The same here. 
you, you're thinking about these concepts because these are the views that Buddha would say from his experience. It's not from revelation. It's not, he's not made it up. He's not a creator. He's not shoving it down our throat. He is suggesting this is how existence is. And if we get our minds in sync with this, this is the source of reality, of happiness. We've got to find that out. You know? Do you understand? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. But what helps is, because there is so much information, and also what helps is because we're creatures of habit and we know that a discipline a structure in our life can be helpful you know so that, mm -hmm. that's why a, a, a structure of a practice something in the morning and something at night can really and that's what you, you got in the information there from all the refuge stuff you have mm -hmm. a simple meditation in the morning you tick your boxes throughout the day you watch your mind and then the end mm -hmm. of the day you do purification you go to bed with a happy mind that really helps as well do you understand yes, yes I do. okay thank you Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Can you say more about the end of the day purification? I will do that definitely. Okay, let's talk about that. I will. So, okay, one of the views in that, that Buddha is presenting to us, which actually he doesn't, and that's again, I want to repeat it. It's a crucial point. He doesn't, Buddhism isn't made up by the Buddha. It's like Einstein didn't make up relativity. It's a really interesting concept. He didn't make it up and say, here it is, and you have to believe it. He said, he's observed that this is how things are. He presents his findings and he says, if you want to learn to, to do the same thing, over to you. Here's my methodology. Well, Buddha's the same. So he's observed this fundamental point that's the actual basis of all the Buddhist philosophical view of the universe. That the universe is consisting of trillions of sentient beings, mind possessors. That's the literal translation of the Tibetan word, sem chen. I find that very delicious. A mind possessor. And there are trillions, not just humans. Mind in Buddhism is used in a in a in a different way. We, we, we think it refers to the brain in our neuro, in our neuroscientific psychological world, but the Buddha would refer to it as all our thoughts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, mind or consciousness are used synonymously. And for the Buddha, by definition, they're not physical. They're, they're not a function of your brain. They work interdependently with your brain. And uh, but, they, but, they, but they're not physical. It's a fundamental point. We start with that point. But that's just incidental in a sense here. So then this mind of ours, also it doesn't, um, the Buddha would say it doesn't come from your mummy or daddy and it doesn't come from a creator, nor does it come from nothing. So the only other option, if we, when we ask the question, where do I come from? Where did I begin? And we have this question. Then if you track yourself back to your first second of conception and you track your mind back, your thoughts and feelings and emotions, this river of mental moments, you track it back, you'd end up at the first second of conception. Then you have to ask the question, where was this mind of mine the second before? Well, your egg was in mummy's body, the sperm was in daddy's body, but your mind, your continuity of mental moments can track itself back to a previous moment of this river of mental moments, which a few weeks before that was in another body, the Buddha would say. So this is this fundamental view of reincarnation, continuity of consciousness, and the, this concept of karma. This natural law that Buddha has observed plays out in the minds of all sentient beings. It's a natural law. No one runs it. It's not punishment. It's not reward. This is the Buddha's view, and it's 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 practice. It's, 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 it's happening every second. So okay, given this law that everything I think and do and say programs my mind with those tendencies, those habits, those thoughts, and leaves imprints or seeds in my mind, if you like, that ripen. This is where it all bit abstract for us. In the future, after this life, even in four ways, the type of rebirth. It's all in the literature. It's all covered. It's extensive. I'm just making the point here. One of the ways our actions, karma, our tendencies, our actions of the mind, and then which drives the actions of our body and speech. All the, those actions. Excuse me ripen, leave seeds in the mind that will ripen in the future, in that mind, in that continuity of mental moments, in four ways. The first is a type of rebirth. The second is a tendency similar to that one. The third is an experience similar to that. And fourth is even what they call an environmental result. 
all this is covered in all the it's all there described in all the literature just giving the essence so that so give so the first general point about karma is that everything you think you do and say and i really think this is a really good way of putting it and would have liked it programs us in just the same way that if you play if you practice musical theory and then play music every day you are basically programming yourself and you turn yourself into a musician. It's hardly surprising. Well, the Buddha says everything we're thinking and doing and saying, including love and hate and anger and jealousy and depression and killing and lying and stealing, that is also producing the person we become. I think we get this when it comes to you know scientific things and artistic things. We know we produce the person we become, but we don't think that when it comes to happiness and suffering, I'd suggest. We think all the outside world are the main players in whether I'm happy or suffering. Buddha would say, just like if you're a carpenter or a musician, what you do in your mind and then in your actions, that's the main player that produces the person you become. This is a way of describing the law of karma. So given, so the next level of, so given that everything I think and do and say programs me and produces my future. So the next level of detail is almost very simple. You know, Buddha says, if you look at the world, and he's got, again, this is an analysis of the Buddhist view of the mind, that we've only got three kinds of three kinds of experiences in the sense, so insofar as we've got happy, happy feelings, unhappy feelings, and then there's a sort of a category called neutral. Well, forget those, okay? Now, we know we want happy feelings, and we know we don't want suffering feelings. So suffering feelings, and then indeed suffering experiences. We want happy feelings and happy experiences. This is hardly rocket science. So, for example, <laughs> sorry, my endless anal not analogies, my endless allergies in New York. I keep thinking I've got rid of them, but I haven't. So, everything we think and do and say produces us. So, every action we do that's labeled negative, that's not moralistic, it's practical. In other words, an action we do with our body and speech that's driven by attachment, anger, fears, depression, jealousy, low self esteem you know, join the universe, they're going to they're gonna have a suffering result in terms of a type of rebirth, a tendency, an experience, and an environmental result. And anything that's labelled virtuous or positive or ethical, and actually we do with our body and speech is based on kindness or love or compassion, for example, will we'll, we'll ripen as happy rebirth, happy tendency, happy experience, and happy environmental result. Speaking really simply, this is the this is what Buddha says is reality, and it's presented in great detail in all the literature, and it's all there for those who want to look into it. So, of course, we can't prove it immediately. We're not clairvoyant, so we have to, if you choose, take it as your working hypothesis. This is the best way to say it. So then, given that we want happiness and don't want suffering, forget the long-term result of Buddhahood. Forget even the less long-term, but still long-term result of nirvana, it, it, liberation from suffering and its causes. Forget that. Just regular happiness, please. Re you know, a reasonable another human body with reasonable conditions and reasonable mummy and daddy and friends and people not hating me and killing me and stealing from me and lying to me and or not living on the streets and being neurotic and with a pleasant world, a pleasant life, simply speaking. They have causes and they've got nothing to do with a creator. External things play a role, but the key cause, and this is a very shocking thing for us, we do not think... Joe, about or do you like Joseph? Uh, actually, I beg your pardon? They call me Joseph. Who's Joseph. chatting away there? Can you turn yourself off, please? Yeah, don't 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 I can't see anything. Yes, okay, fine. Um, okay, so given that I do want happiness and don't want suffering, then it's I need to take stock of that, and there are different ways of doing that. And this is like junior school entry level grade one first level of the first level of practice in buddhism it's not even work on your mind yet it's not even you know it's not even meditate yet it's work on your body and speech work on the servants of your mind this is the first level eileen this is the very first level of practice you control your body and speech so then you know you just you make a decision to abide by these natural laws of karma because you don't want future suffering then you stop causing it you, if you don't want a future headache, you stop causing it. If you don't want diabetes, you stop causing it. If you don't want to have cancer of the lungs, you stop causing it. 
It's very logical. If you want a flower, you, you, you practice causing it. If you don't want a weed, you stop causing it. It's sort of logical. But the idea here is one has to take responsibility. Whereas we tend to think suffering comes from out there and it's not my fault, you know? Very deep instinct of ego to think that. Buddha says that's quite impressive. So the very first level of practice is at least refrain, consciously, intentionally decide, well, you know, I won't kill, I won't steal, I won't harm others, I'll do my best to contain my body and speech and at least not harm sentient beings. And that's pretty intense. Can you imagine someone consciously deciding in their life to be a non-harming person? That's a pretty intense decision to make. That's the very first thing to do. But given that my mind comes from countless lifetimes and has already got billions of karmic seeds in there, all my bank vaults, because nothing goes astray, then I've also wanna, I also want to put a few atomic bombs under them so that they don't ripen in the future. I can't, you know, I can't not do them. They're already done. They're in the bank vault. The seeds are in the bank vault. But I've got to put atomic bombs under them to prevent them from ripening as my future suffering. That's what purification is. So there's either the, you know, speaking simply, of course, either the, you know, planting good seeds, refraining from planting bad seeds, and then purifying the previous bad seeds, and then consciously trying to plant good, good seeds. It's a simple analogy, but that's really a very simple way of putting what a daily practice is. So far, so good? Okay. So... There are four steps in this purification process. And there's all sorts of formal practices for doing it. And, you know, but I, I like to do this very informally. So we make it something experiential, make it sort of psychological. It's all psychology. The mind, Buddha didn't use the word psychology. He doesn't speak Greek. You know, we love that word, psychology, sounds so serious. But it's just your mind. You know, it's your mind. What goes on in your mind, what we're trying to handle and deal with. And that includes the karmic imprints from the actions of my body and speech as well that are programmed in my mind. And I want to start to reverse this process. I want to start to mold my mind into the shape I want. So it's really good to see it as experiential, as psychological, which is exactly what it is. And it's, it's something that we tend to do at the end of the day, you kind of take stock of your day. So there's, it's nice to remember there's the four R's. Helpful to remember. The first one is regret. We can spend the rest of the day talking about this one because this is not what we tend to think. We have a very strong instinct to get, have guilt. So what is guilt? You think I did this and I did that. And then immediately we think, and I'm a bad person. It's very, it's primordially instinctive. And that goes pretty deep. And, and, it's, and I think it's good to analyze why we have guilt psychologically. What is guilt? You know, I find it's very interesting to look at it. It's very instinctive. And I've got a feeling, it's if we analyze it this way, it's really rooted in the deepest attachment we have. Forget attachment to sex and drugs and rock and roll, you know, but attachment, the deepest one since we're born, is this primordial hunger to be approved of, to be seen as a good girl. In fact, this attachment is so primordial that it's almost as if we think we're nothing unless we get someone smiling at us and saying, that's a good thing to do, Rabina. Then we feel, oh, I must have done the right thing. So as soon as we have that ingrained in us, and since we're born, we've internalized what mummy said we should and shouldn't do, what daddy says, what grandma says, what God says, what the politicians say, what the government says. We've internalized all these do's and don'ts. And there's nothing wrong with do's and don'ts, but we hear them in a neurotic way. We hear them as you know, if they bring fear because we want to be seen as a good girl. We don't want to be found out doing naughty things. So we spend our lives trying to hide our naughty things and try to be seen to do good things because we need to be approved of. It's very demented, actually, but we all recognize it. That brings guilt. So in other words, as soon as you see yourself do a naughty thing, you immediately imagine mummy punishing your daddy or God or somebody, which is why we think if no one catches me, oh, I got away with that. The Buddha will say that's very schizophrenic, very demented. It's like going to your doctor and she says, don't smoke. And you say, why not? And you should ask. And she'll show you cancerous lungs in a video. That's why you shouldn't smoke, Rabina. So you don't think 
oh my god she's going to punish me with cancer if i smoke you don't you would be laughed at if you thought that's what the doctor was saying but that's how we hear ethics and morality someone says don't do it and if you do it you get punished that's deep in our bones don't blame your jewish mother or your catholic mother that's an ego's view it's the view of ego and we bring it with us we have created that view it's primordial so guilt is a, a fruit of that you know so this first one regret is completely different but we because guilt is so instinctive we have to cultivate this view so the, so regret the first step's the same well i did do that and i did kick the dog and i did cheat on my boyfriend and i did steal the five dollars or whatever you know an action that, if it's imprinted in your mind, will bring you future suffering. That's the, the constant analogy has to be like the doctor. Smoking will cause you future suffering. Smoking won't cause you to get punished. We hear it as punishment. That's our mistake. So lying and killing and stealing for the Buddha is like eating sugar. It'll produce your diabetes. It'll produce your suffering. They've got to look into this, of course. It's not how we think. So regret is this wholesome, the first step, is this wholesome recognition. Well, you know, I did eat sugar. You don't get, then you don't then say, oh, and I'm a bad person. And you sit there getting all freaked out. You're just going to get worse. What good is that? That's not ownership. So you say, I did kill, I did steal, I did lie, whatever. And then the second part, as opposed to, oh, I'm a bad person, you have to consciously say, what can I do about it? It's accountability. It's responsibility. As soon as you recognize that you've just eaten that sugar, oh, my God, I can't believe I ate that sugar. I'll get diabetes. Then you go to the next step. What can I do about it? Whom can I turn to? Where's the method? Where's the doctor? It's a really practical step. We get it when it comes to our health, but not when it comes to what we call morality or ethics. We just become very childish. So it needs cultivating. And the crucial essence of regret is this at least the theoretical idea that whatever you think and do and say produces you moment by moment it's hardly a difficult concept but it's very shocking to hear it because we don't think that so regrets is first step you sit down at the end of the day and you know you, you check you talk to yourself you are purifying <laughs> so the first step is you think, okay, I screamed at my sister and bad-mouthed my husband and whatever you did, murdered my father, whatever you did, you know, you grab hold of it. Things you can remember. Because we carry them as such a burden anyway, so it's good to bring it up. Well, I did do those actions. You're talking to yourself, and I regret having done those actions. Don't just leave it there. You say, because you know why, Ravina? Because I don't want these future habits. I don't want the consequences of these actions. I don't want the future habit. I don't want those things to happen to me. This is, you know, so this takes a while because the idea of karma that we produce ourselves is, is not natural to us. It's, if you're Indian and, you know, Tibetan, it's in your bones for 1,200, 2,000 years, you know. For us, it's a brand new concept. So it takes time to take this on board as your view if you choose to. And that's what the very first step is based on. Not guilt, but useless, utterly useless. You have to speak it out. I regret having done that because I don't want the future results. We get it when it comes to the body. It's what I find fascinating. I mean, look at the nutritional things on every single packet of food you'll ever buy now. We are so we are so aware of what we put into our mouth. Every every label tells you exactly, and we watch it like a hawk because we know that the food we eat produces the body that we have in the future. We don't want a suffering body. It's so logical. Well, this is about your mind and your future experiences. The Buddha says, we are the boss. The first step is power. Your own responsibility. Venerable? Uh, about regret. What do you mean? I, I have a question about regret. Here you go. So I, there are things that, that at the end of the day, maybe there are things I regret that day. I was rude. I snapped at someone, whatever. But then there's all... Regret from the rest of my life. That's exactly right. And of course. So where do you start? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll tell you. That's this is the first step, and I'll tell you the second step. So the next step is having remembered the few things you've done. Then you maybe take 
the thing you've done in this life that you remember that are like our actions you've done just as a reminder because i mean if we've got mind that goes back and back and if every minute second of whatever we think and do and say leaves seeds in the mind there are plenty of seeds planted so you can logically deduce you've done masses of things and the buddha would say there's no life we haven't had there's no terrible thing we haven't done before there's no good thing we haven't done before you know except we haven't realized emptiness haven't become a buddha so you, your first thing is you remember some things and, and maybe and it's helpful because they're your tendencies to get angry easily or upset people so you remember those then you think of those things you can't remember now you think of the other ones in the rest of your life that you've done in this life so i always think of my abortion you know i always use this example because it's very helpful the way that karma ripens and one of our problems when we do things like that many women have so much guilt i don't know if men have guilt about being part of an abortion have any men have guilt about being part of an abortion Yes. Not yes. yes. Yeah. Guilty. Yes. Is there any men here? You're a man. You're a man. Yes. I can't tell anybody anymore. I can't tell. Get with a beard. Even then, you can't tell. <laughs> so you, it's a guilt over abortion. It's interesting, isn't it? So let's analyze. It's a really good one. I like talking about this because it shows the karmic relationship between the person you harm. So in my case, I always tell the story. I'm trying to bore you. If you've heard it a thousand times, when I was a hippie in London in the 1960s. I remember I felt very, I got pregnant. This bloke was in the bed, obviously. We were in a bed, well, we were in a bed, what to do. And I'm not being too personal, I'm sorry. But the second that action happened, I knew that second I was pregnant. I, I knew that second consciousness, I didn't know the words, came into my womb or my fallopian tube, whatever. It was crystal clear. And I many women tell me this. One, I always use the example of a friend of mine, her daughter was staying in the house with the mother while the daughter and her husband were building their own house and the daughter and the husband. So the daughter came down for breakfast. The husband was there too. The daughter came down for breakfast and said, oh, mum, I'm pregnant. And the mother said, oh, great. When did you discover? She said, 40 minutes ago. Do you understand? <laughs> Many women say that they know they're pregnant. That, and, that's the, and that's the interesting point. In Buddhism, that's when the consciousness goes into the egg and sperm at the time. That's what conception is, when the egg and sperm come together. So it's interesting. Many women have that. I don't know if men do as well, but there you go. So anyway, in my case, I knew that second. And the next second, oh, there I was with this bloke. The next second, the thought was, I'll have an abortion. Well, so interesting. This is the way they talk about karma. You see, the view of karma is nothing happens randomly. We really do believe that life is random, I think. We think we didn't ask to get born. No one knows what's going on. I mean, if you're a Christian, you know that someone has a plan. And if you have faith in God, you're happy for him to keep his plan in his pocket. He doesn't have to tell you because you have faith in God. I'm not complaining about that view. You'll live a very happy life if you truly have faith in God. But that's not the view here, completely different. Buddha has got nothing to do with the way the world is. He's, he's a person who's observed the world. And his view is that every living being creates karma, does action in the body, speech, and mind every second, which program their mind. And then secondly, we meet, whoever we meet, whatever they do to us, it can't be a random thing if this is a natural law. This is the idea of natural law, which we really get when it comes to science, you know. Once you learn the natural law of botany, you know it works every time. That's the whole point about a law. It's coherent, it's consistent. Well, here, this is what karma is, what it says. So whoever you meet, so this is consciousness, this person, I always think of it as a her, who, with whom I had strong karmic history, who came along, who died a few weeks before, and at the time of her past death, a virtuous karmic seed of non-killing had been triggered in her mind. And then when she died, and then she took the opportunity, the second I hopped into bed with this boy, she ran like a magnet and jumped into my fallopian tube. Karma, our, our history with each other caused that, you know. She, it was very specific karma she created as a result of virtue to get a human mother. Next second, as soon as she hits the womb, guess what? Her other karma called experiences similar to the cause, which is the stuff that happens to us. Another karma of hers from having killed, and guess who, me in the past, karma's very personal. That was triggered when I said, and I'll have an abortion. <laughs> Do you understand, people, what I'm saying? So the thing is, it's it's a two-way thing. What happens, we get all this guilt, I killed a baby. Yes, I did. But uh, and it's not trying to get you off the hook, but that could not possibly have happened to that fetus if she hadn't created the cause 
to be killed by having killed me in the past. And the same with virtuous things. It's not possible that something can happen randomly. You know, we think, oh, it's good luck winning the lottery. No, you created generosity in the past and a seeming random choosing of a bunch of numbers is, is the trigger, is the catalyst that triggers your past virtuous karma of generosity to ripen as you're receiving money. Nothing is random when it comes to karma. It's a very fascinating view. It's what we think of as science, but it's quite shocking to us because we do not think this, you know. So this person who came to my womb, she had the karma to be a human. The first way karma ripens is a type of a rebirth. She had the karma to get a human birth. Second, I don't know what her tendencies were because I... I, you know, I aborted her little fetus. She was only 12 weeks old when she got aborted, so I didn't have a chance to get to know her mind. But third, she had the karma called experience, similar to the cause, to be killed by me. And indeed, I felt very fortunate. It was 1968. The government had just legalised free abortions. I went to the hospital, the Charing Cross Hospital. I saw the doctor. I gave him some reason why I deserved an abortion. I went to the hospital. The nurses were very kind. They gave me a bed, and, they, and, and I had the abortion. So meaning I gave permission to the nurses and the doctors to, you know, cut out this little baby. And then the little baby created the cause. This person, she didn't come out properly the first time. They had to do another DNC because they all mangled it. So that's the kind of this little person as well. So it's a dynamic, it's a dynamic, we have some history together. I've never had that thought before or since, you know. I never killed anything. I never thought to kill an ant or a dog or a fish. I tried my fishing one time, went to, to impress a boyfriend. Fish were coming to his hook. No one come to mine. I didn't have the karma to, there's no beings had the karma to be killed by me. The fetus was the only one, that human. That's how karma works. So, so I think I did that action. Due to my ignorance in the past, I didn't think of her as a human being. The karma imprint was strong. I said, I'm going to have an abortion. And I did that. I took, so I take responsibility. I re, and so I think, well, I regret having done that. Why? Because that will leave an imprint in my mind to continue to be killed, to continue to kill. And I don't want that. So I regret it. And then, of course, I think of all the other abortions I must have had in countless past lives. And all the other, then you think all the other things that you don't remember. And there must be trillions of actions. Where's Sheila? Hello, dearest one. Come on in. Are you listening, Sheila? I'm answering you. Yes. Of course. You're hearing me. Okay, good. So then you think, and so then you sort of say, and you know what, Sheila, you talk to yourself, whatever I have done since beginningless time with my body and my speech to harm countless sentient beings, the seeds of which are in my mind and which I don't want to, to ripen, I regret them from the depths of my heart. Because you know what, Sheila, you say to yourself, I don't want them to ripen. Do you see? You'd have to remember them. I mean, if you've eaten too many M&Ms and you look and see they're all coming out on your skin, you don't need to know which M&M on what day. You just get you, you get the lesson. Do you understand my point? Yeah, yeah. That's the attitude. And it's, not, it's a wholesome kind of owning of it all. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Remember you can remember, and it's good to remember your old tendencies, good to remember the some things in this life, and then whatever I've done to cause suffering to other sentient beings in my body and speech. Do you understand? That's the attitude. Does that make sense? Yeah. You cover the lot, you know. So far, so good. Okay, good. Hello, darlings. Hello, sweethearts. So then, then that's the second. So that's the first step is regret. Then you think, like with a doctor, oh my God, who can I turn to? Where's the doctor whose methods I can use to heal me? And that's the big one that's very powerful here. Typically, in the second step, we visualize the Buddha. There's a certain practice we do. We visualize a certain aspect of the Buddha above our crown. So automatically, because we're visualizing the Buddha, we think it's like the Buddha does the job. No, he's not doing a job. You're doing it. You're just visualizing, imagining the Buddha. You take refuge. You delight that you found a doctor. And then the second part of the second step is you now have compassion for those you've harmed. So the first step regrets like compassion for yourself. And then, you know, the second step, you now have, once you visualize the Buddha above your head, when you take refuge or delight that you found a doctor whose methods you can use, whose medicine you can use to heal you, you do the work. Then the second step of the second step, the second part of the second step is you now have compassion for those you've harmed. The first one is, is specifically for yourself. And I think we miss this first step in our, in the West. We think it sounds like selfish. What do you mean I regret killing because I don't want future suffering? You've got to, you've got, you don't think it's selfish to regret smoking because you might get cancer. It's just called intelligence. Same here. 
It's really, it's like compassion for yourself. The second step is now you have compassion for those you have harmed. So I think of that, that sentient being. And yes, she created the cause to get harmed. But I have compassion for her because I harmed her. No question. There's no doubt. So I have some compassion. And then for all the other bees I've harmed, intentionally or not. You know, all this, and then think it says beginning this time, all the sentient beings I've harmed. With my body and speech. I regret for their sake now. I must purify for their sake. Very specific compassion for others. And if you can, here you now also have compassion for those who have harmed you. Now, if that's too heavy for us, we haven't yet come got to that point, then you leave it alone. But you now have compassion for those who harmed you. And why would you do that? And this is where, unless you understand karma, this has no meaning. So I regret the harm that others have done to me because they will suffer as a result of those actions. That's really profound compassion. And comp that's why compassion to this degree is based on the logic of karma. First compassion for yourself and then compassion for those you've harmed and compassion for those who've harmed you. This is the basis of this kind of much deeper level of compassion. Then the third step is you do this particular meditation we do, visualizing nectar, you're just using your creative imagination, visualizing nectar coming from the Buddha above your crown. And there's a recitation of a certain mantra. This is a very popular practice that we all do. So you are doing the purification. The Buddha's there, yes. You're imagining nectar coming from the Buddha, yes. But it's your mind doing it. So as Lama Yeshi says, purification, you know, as he says, we create negativity with our mind. And so we purify it by creating positivity with our mind. And the power of this, of this purification is the power of your regret, the power of your compassion and refuge, the power of this third one, the remedy. It's your mind doing it. It's your mind visualizing. It's your mind and your speech reciting the sound of the Sanskrit syllable, said to be very powerful. This is what purification is, your mind changing. And then the fourth step, you know, the resolve to change. So if you've taken lay vows, for example, you reiterate your vows here. I will never kill. I will never steal. I will never lie. So what you're doing is you're strengthening that habit in your mind. And then those things you can't guarantee you are doing again because they're very deep habits, then you give yourself a timeline. Because we all know when you decide to do something is when you do it. So this is the purification practice. Clear? Do you have questions from it? No? Not directly. What, darling? Not directly. Not directly. Not directly. Mm. Maybe indirectly. Mm. Well, tell me. You're not fully formed. What's the, oh, okay, fine. Good. Yes. Question on karma. Um, yeah. I've been encountering scenarios in my life where I will perceive something as wrong that, let's say, an organization does. So, for example, it might be my health insurance plan is, is ripping me off no, in a certain way. Yeah. And <laughs> I will initially have a phone call with them and tell them nicely and they'll say, okay, yeah. we'll, we'll do something with maybe nothing. Okay. So notice the perspective is applying a bit of pressure by yeah. writing a written letter. Sure. Also telling them and sending it to your regulator. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. something else. Sure. And I've noticed that also when I volunteer with certain nonprofits on those, everyone's being really nice to each other, but not getting the thing done. And so sometimes I find putting pressure. I understand. So the question is if you encounter an organization or even a person who's beating another person on the street and you judge that that is wrong. Well, forget that first. Let's just have the examples of where it's happening to you. So, so what's the question? The question is, I am finding that it feels right to me to address yeah. the situation Good, yeah. is to, to do something yeah. that is, is going to make other people pretty uncomfortable. By, by writing, let's say, right. uh, pretty direct. Okay, that's letter. good. So the question is that is, is, is that creating? Okay, good. Like, I, what are the I understand exactly. Okay, so here we go. 
you've got this conventional agreement with a company, as to, yeah. you know, an insurance company, that you do this and they'll do that. And they don't do their bit. So it's on a conventional sense, it's inappropriate. It's absolutely correct. It's correct. So there's nothing wrong with trying to get what's right. But the point is your motivation has to be two various things. First of all, your motivation has got to be good, not arrogant, not how dare these. That's not going to help you. That just pollute the whole action. You know, but the real one that's very powerful that takes a lot of time to really take on board is the reason in the first place this has happened is because you haven't got the you created the cause by some action in past and probably past lives that have blocked your getting your rights. So in other words, if you've got so it could even be some stealing car. So if you're not getting what you deserve, like you, you know. That's that's some karma you created. Always the first cause of every good thing that happens, and always the first cause of every bad thing that happens is whatever action I did in the past. So first you own that. Okay, I must have created the cause to block this happening smoothly. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Then nevertheless, it's still appropriate, but even if you have compassion for the others, not sentimental rubbish, but it is appropriate that they do their job for their sake as much as anything. And then with a recognition that it's your past karma that blocks it, you would also, before you even do anything with the company, you, in your purification practice, I'll go into this in more detail in a minute, the very first step, regret. That, e okay, each of those four steps, regret, reliance, resolve, and the remedy, purify each of the four ways that karma ripens. The four ways that karma ripens. So the third way that karma ripens is called experiences, similar to the cause. So you go, ah, uh ah, -uh, this is an experience of my having maybe lied in the past or stolen in the past. That's why it's blocking me getting what I deserve. Do you understand? Yeah. So then you, re in your practice that evening, you regret whatever past action that you did to these people. Don't be surprised next day to fix it because you just shifted the karma. So you've got to factor that piece in first. And that's pretty intense for us. We don't like to do that because we just think it's all coming from the outside. That's your first one. And then with compassion and clarity and wisdom, do your practice, regret whatever you did in the past. It's the main cause of why it's not happening. And don't be surprised it could happen. And then do what you can if it doesn't to try to enable it to happen. And if it really doesn't happen, that means there's no karma there. You just can't. I mean, look at the number of people who are in prison who can't ever get out, even though they're innocent. Look at the people who get stolen, killed, lives, stolen, the karma is so strong. No matter how much you even purify, it doesn't always change it. So you do what you can, you own it, you have compassion, you have wisdom, you're clear. Yeah, make people unhappy, that's okay. Do what's right. And then if it still doesn't happen, you've got to make a decision. Are you with me? So the idea is, if I'm noticing like that yeah, the company is screwing me and other consumers, it would be, think of where I may have done yeah, because yeah. it wouldn't be happening if you hadn't created the cause, no matter how many lifetimes ago. So whatever the action is, and usually that that been people are stealing from you. That's pretty clear. Yeah. You've done that in the past. Some kind, or you, you understand? Where have or I not lived up to my end of bargain? Like, sorry, think, sorry, what? think about where have I not lived up to my end of bargain? Well, or, or, uh, yeah, I mean, say it that way would be more specific and just think. Well, if I'm being stolen from, it's because I have stolen. If I'm not being given what I deserve, it's because I've stolen. If someone's not believing my words, I must have lied. If someone is being abusive to me, I must have abused them. It's very evident. Experience similar to the cause tells you exactly the words. So when you have experiences, people are kind and loving to you. That's because you created the cause. People speak, believe your words, even if you're lying. Look at Mr. Trump. Mm -hmm. Half the Americans believe every word he says. That's due to his past truth-telling to them. So you'd be very specific with this way of karma ripens. Does it make sense? You've got yes. to look into it and study it, think about it, you know? So that's your own responsibility first. What must have I done in the past to create the cause to block to not to, to be causing, then you own responsibility and purify it in your evening practice, and then you do what you can the next day to make it happen. And but your purifying can be one of the main causes to shift the blocks. You see my point? You see my point? I mean, often I talk this, I talk to Gina because she helps some people in what country in Africa? What country? Uganda. And it's kind of poor people, suffering people, where the karma is so heavy. You can, you, you know, I remember, and, and so it's, you've got to work 20 times harder. 
for people in that kind of situation to help them because their karma is so heavy, meaning from their own past lives, the karma is so heavy, it's really hard to get help through to them. So we have to recognize the karmic one, which is not easy for us in the West, you know. I remember one time I told you, know, I remember hearing about one NGO working so hard helping all the suffering people in one particular country and sending food and rice and things and the pots. Well, the only thing that arrived was the pots. The rice didn't arrive, the pots arrived. So we, we don't like this view in our culture because it sounds like you're blaming the victim. But the Buddha's view is so fundamentally this point that everything any being ever experiences, good or bad, is the fruit of actions that person's done. In other words, it makes us the owner, the creator of our own realities, which is kind of tense. I guess the part um, where, where I'm struggling is... Um, Viviana and Cyril, won't be long. Go on. Sorry, if you were to have seen a situation like when there was apartheid in South Africa prior to Mandela, that's exactly right. If you had seen that situation and there was a really strong boycott, I that's think, right, of like Sun City and all that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, would, question. If you were someone who was boycotting, would that would that have been the right action to put put pressure? Okay, on? there's the wisdom wing, which is the work you do to lessen your own neuroses, to purify your karma, to stop being neurotic, to stop harming others, and purify your mind to become steady and wise. That's the first step. Second, on the basis of this, you do what you can to help others. So whatever you think with a good motivation, you you don't you don't hold your breath and know suddenly because there's a you know a uh, what do you call it? what was the word? A boycott? Yeah, a boycott. Oh, it's, it's got to be perfect again. No, it might because the karma of the people is so heavy. They might it not might not change for a hundred years. But you do what you can to help others. You do everything you can do what you can. So she works away in Uganda. It might never bring much results, but it, you do what you can. Do you understand? To help others with a good motivation, with compassion. Do you understand? Yes. And it might not bring the result. So not to you know, shout and yell and scream. You know, you can talk to the insurance company called cows come home, but it might never happen. So you've got to make a choice. Let go or change insurance companies and cut your losses. Do you understand? Yes, yes uh, Viviana, yes. sweetheart. Hi, beloved, uh, venerable Robin. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, um, my question is, in the end of the purification, you speak about the to meditate about the emptiness of a free circle. Oh, okay. This is something that's a bit a bit tricky. That's a bit of a tricky one, Viviana. It's quite subtle point. But I think I won't answer that for now, but I will answer it at some point. It's a very it's quite sophisticated practice. And that's, that's something, for me. Uh, some, uh, something that Lama Zopa recommends, you know. We'll discuss it at another time, Viviana. So keep hold of it. I understand exactly. I understand, sweetheart. So keep a note of it in your mind and we will go into it, okay? Thank you, Viviana. That's for me. Thank in you, strong experience. What, sweetheart? What did you say, darling? Maybe I'm sorry, but because for me it's a very strong, fourth experience, important. Okay, it is. It is a good point. So let's discuss it in a minute. Thank you, Viviana. Yes, Cyril. No. And then after this Zoom user, who's Zoom user? Who is talking? You're waving your hand. Who oh, are you? Yeah, that's Sergio. Sergio. Yeah. Hi. Okay, Sergio, just a minute. Cyril has got his hand up. I'll sure. talk to you in a minute, Sergio. After Cyril. Oh. Thank you, sweetheart. Yes, Cyril. Hello, dear Venera Bobina, and happy birthday. Thank uh, you, Sweetheart. Uh, yes, I have a question because uh, in uh, some uh, text by uh, Lama Zopa, and also I have heard this story, uh, To he says uh, to give up attachment to this life. Uh, give up attachment to this life, but um, when I think about it, uh, I find it very difficult uh, because I, I feel like I'm very attached to this life. Of course, that's right, everybody is. Yes. So the so, question is? So, I mean, uh, how can we do to not be attached to this life? I mean, okay, I understand. So, listen, if you were playing tennis for the first day and Federer says, now play a backhand. Well, you can only play a backhand according to your capacity, can't you? Keep your microphone on. If you uh, play the very first day, you can only do what you can do. You can only do what you're capable of. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. Well, it's exactly the same here. You can only do what you can do according to your capacity. So what do you think it means? I mean, there's a very specific way they talk in Tibetan Buddhist. What do you think it means give up attachment to this life? What do you think 
Rinpoche means. I mean, if Federer says play a backhand, you should know what it means. So what do you think it means to give up attachment to this life, Cyril? Um, that's a show, that's the point. <laughs> well, that's I the point. So the very first question is, you should know what it means. Yes, yes. I okay, it's, it's quite to, a... To, to I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Uh, sorry? What did it start again? Maybe I think he means uh, to be concerned by the future lives, future lives, maybe, no? Be concerned by the what? The future lives. Future what? Future lives. Future lives. Future lives. Future lives. Future lives. Oh, okay. You mean you should be or shouldn't be concerned with your future life? What maybe you I, sh I should be concerned. Okay, by so listen, life. the point is this, Cyril, and it takes time to understand it. It means you have to understand how attachment works. So attachment, as you must have heard from the thousand times of hearing the teachings, is this intense emotional hunger coming from a feeling of not having enough, not being enough, that causes us to believe totally that when we get the cake and the pleasure and the music and the food and the sex and the drugs and the rock and roll or whatever it is, when we get that, we will get happy. Are you understanding me? So yes. you will get happy feelings. There's no doubt. When you eat that cake, it will trigger happy feelings. When you have that nice exchange, you listen to that nice music, it will trigger happy feelings. But all the Buddha is pointing out, and this is very hard to see, is because it's driven by this neurotic emotional hunger called attachment, that actually in the end, you don't, I mean, the pleasure starts at the first mouthful, but attachment's never happy. So the first mouthful brings the best pleasure, but you, attachment is standing right there in your mind and it's not satisfied with that pleasure. So the attachment makes you eat another piece of cake, forcing you to believe that they, maybe that will bring the pleasure. And then you eat another piece of cake and then believing maybe the pleasure will come now. And before you know it, you want to vomit because you've eaten so much cake. What happened to the pleasure? So it's the analysis in a very subtle way of how this attachment way we do things is, is a lie. It's like lying. It's not what we think. So we have to analyze it carefully. So that doesn't mean you've got to go kill yourself. Oh, well, I'll just give up cake. No, we learn to understand attachment and we learn to not believe in it so strongly. Giving up attachment. Forget future lives or everything else. It's giving up that fantasy idea. That's what it means. So it takes time internally to observe that process and learn from it. Are we communicating? Yes. Uh, Good, so that'll do. Thank you. Sergio, talk to me. Sergio. Unmute, sweetheart. Unmute, Sergio. Hi. 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 Yeah, okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, I wanted to say, you know, my wife died of cancer, you know, yes. and I wanted to ask you how responsible is she? And another question is, and what can I do about it? And even more importantly, what, what she, if anything, can do about it? She, you say she did die? Yeah, she did die. Yeah. When was that? When was that, Sergio? Well, in January 8th, it's going to be four years. Okay, darling. Okay. So first of all, the general idea of karma is the best that I answer it in just general principles. That The point that Buddha is making is this. Every moment of good things happening and every moment of bad things happening, and good things are the things that we like to happen, and bad things are the things we don't like to happen, we know this, but every moment of our experiences, without exception, they're not just random, they're not accidental, they are all related to that person's past experiences. So the Buddha is saying we've all got thousands of negative imprints in our mind from past actions. We've all got thousands of positive imprints. So if you look at your wife's life, she's probably, she had good experiences, she had you as a husband, you maybe were kind to her sometimes, people looked after her, all of those experiences were the fruit of her goodness. And then having suffering things happen, they're the fruit of past action she must have done. So this is just the way it is for every sentient being. 
But also the other point is sometimes it's like when bad things happen, it can also be a, a, a sign of purification for that person. Cleaning up all the past negativity by having suffering can be very positive experience in terms of the long-term view of that person's own mind and their future. So that's the first part. So that the other question for you was what? No, I, I say, what can I do about, you know, I mean, how responsible was she? I understand that now. That, but yeah. if if she, if you talk about eternal reincarnation or, you yes. know, I call that, what can she do about it? I mean, well, okay, what she, I mean, all of us, what can any one of us do is if yeah. before the death happens, before the cancer happens, before right, you, right. You know, we have to practice every day, do this purification practice every day, because doing the purification practice every day is putting atomic bombs under all the negative tendencies. It's like doing the weeding, it's pulling out the weeds. So one very first level of practice is don't cause more future suffering, abide by the laws of karma, live a good life, try not to kill or steal or lie, and then purify every day. This is already a tremendously powerful practice that can only bring good results for oneself. That's the very first level, Sergio. Do you understand? Make sense? Yes. Good, sweetheart. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Um, as we can people talk about mm. karma being very personal. Being what? Personal. Mm. You have a particular question? Um, well, that... I'm wondering about, you know, the parents you're born with. Okay, sure, sure. I mean, it's very shocking for us. I just have to keep saying it like this. It's very shocking for us in our materialist view. Because, I mean, the materialist, we might be Christians or Muslims, but the materialist view of the world, I'm not being sarcastic, it's a philosophical viewpoint, the scientific viewpoint. I'm not being critical. It's it's really is the, the view that we have as the reality, as the truth. And according to that reality, you know, we what we do know, we don't have it, we don't, we don't talk about the mind being anything but the brain, and it comes from mummy and daddy, and then mummy and daddy come from the grandpa, go back to grandma and the monkeys, and that's the way we track back the past. And we and we don't know why bad things happen. We haven't yet found the reasons in the scientific world why Hitler's and why Mother Teresa's and why Stalin's and why Ukraine wars. We can look at some aspect of it. Historically, we can see. But we really don't, haven't got the answers in the philosophical materialist view. And that's perfectly fine. But all I'm saying is Christians have a view, Muslims have a view, Buddhism has a view. So the Buddhist view, which is what I'm discussing here, is that everything in the universe is driven by this natural law called karma. We don't need a creator. We don't need to be created. Our mind goes back and back and back. One, two, everything our mind does, so seeds in the mind that produce one, a type of rebirth, two, a tendency in the mind in that rebirth, three, an experience similar to the cause of those past actions in that rebirth. And that's referring to all the stuff that happens to us at the hands of others. So, it's not random. We think it's, you know, your mother and father have sex and they make you, you know, like they suddenly invent you and plonk you on this planet. But I think that's a ridiculous idea. Your consciousness was before. At the time of your past death, not more than a few weeks before you died, before the few weeks before you came to your new mother's womb, one of your virtuous karmic seeds, just like that fetus in my body, of non-killing was triggered. And then specifically it programmed you to go to this particular mother and that particular father. That is not a random event. So however they are with you, they love you, they hate you, they murder you, they rape you, they give you a million dollars, they adore you, whatever the karma is, that's all called experiences similar to the cause. It's not a random event. If it's a natural, think of the word natural law. You understand? Natural law. Botany is a natural law. We know if we accept botany, once you learn the law, you can you can deduce, you can you can predict every time what kind of flower will come. If you know the natural law of mathematics and engineering, you know you can build a hundred-story building and it'll stay up unless some pilots come along and knock it down. 
So this is a shocking idea to us that this, this that what we think and do and say produces our future experiences, and they can't be random. It's an insanity to think it's random. There's a logic to all of it. We are the cause of our tendencies, our rebirth, who we see, how they treat us, what we it's all the fruit of what we have done in the past, good and bad. Are you communicating? We're communicating. I also have heard that I asked the specific question to a Theravada yeah. monastic, Go, yes, previous yes. monastic. Sure, yeah. And she had replied that it's many causes, many results. So it's like karma in addition to a bunch of different like Well, of course, external things all play a role, isn't it? Of course they do. Yeah. But I mean, the main cause in the Buddha's view is what the person has done in the past that sets you up to meet that mother, that father. And then they, I mean, why that mother? I mean, of course, there's millions of things that happen. But we, we, you sort of, if you think of a flower, you've got to know the main cause first, which is the seed. Mm -hmm. So once you know you want a rose, you get a rose seed. The, the water and the soil is the same whether it's an apricot tree or a rose. But the, the fundamental cause of that, of that flower is the seed. So the seed for the book is what's in the mind of the person who then has the tendency to keep doing the action, has an experience similar to the cause of that action, and even environmental results. Every action we do has these four results. This, this is the analysis. And it's the same teachings in the Theravada and all the two letters. It's all coming from the same source, the same texts. Mm -hmm. You with me? I know. So like, I don't know, I'm finding it hard to wrap my mind around, and this is probably like, a, yeah, I mean, just the idea. Which bit? Is the that idea it? that I'm, if I'm harmed, it's because I harmed that specific person. Right, so why is that hard to understand? Um, if you, if you, millions of beings, what's it got to do with it? It's it was a natural law, though. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I understand. Just, what about being, but is it hard for you to, un, is it hard for you to accept that if a person does something good to you, it's because you would do something good to that person? Because we only ask this question when it comes to bad things, we don't mind the good, we don't find that shocking. Yeah, I mean, I can, I, yeah, that's true. But like, if karma is a natural law, it's hard to hear this because it's not how we think. It's just so different from the way we think, you know. We really believe that life is random. And we really believe that people get harmed for no reason from the side of the person. We really believe that we are innocent victims to whom bad things happen unfairly. That's very deep in our bones, isn't it? Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, so, so yeah, so does karma also apply, like, if I'm, if I have, like, a, you know, if my relationship is, like, you know, founded on the dharma, it's, like, we, like, possibly had like karma from previous lives to like not possibly i mean if, if, if you are playing the piano sweetheart and i observe you playing really well i don't say or oh, perhaps she practiced in the past you don't say perhaps it is logical if i see you play piano you've done it in the past it is a logical deduction if i see you being angry every day it's a logical deduction you practiced anger do you understand mm -hmm. we're not used to thinking this way it's quite an interesting concept. So, so it's like, is it more common to like know people from past lives? So in well, your like, well, no, to know people in past lives. If you're born as a dog in this life, you're gonna, but you got, you're gonna have come with a bunch of different people, obviously, doggies, and or if you're going to be born as a lion, which is possible, you're gonna have come with all the tigers and other people. But if you're born as a human in a Buddhist world, it's very possible it's recent karma from being a human in the Buddhist world. Yeah, of course, sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yes. What's the story with the, you're talking about the four opponent powers. Yes. Right? Um, how does that like go with the Vajrasattva, like within a, a purification? No, I understand, I understand. Yeah. But, okay. The practice is actually called the four opponent powers and the Vajrasattva, as you said, is simply the name given to the third step which is what's called the remedy, where you visualize the Buddha sending nectar as you recite the mantra. That's the third step. Okay. The first step is regretting the bad things you've done, yeah. but you don't want suffering. The second step is, whom can I turn to? The doctor, you have a bunch of above your head, and then you have compassion. The third step is you visualize, and then the fourth step is you vow not to do it again. So the first step, regret, ex purifies experiences similar to the cause. Stuff that happens to you. Even the stuff second, you don't remember doing. Oh, do, yeah. Like I said, you don't have to remember which right. M&N you ate. Okay. You just you can deduce from the results. Yeah. The second step is refuge and compassion that purifies the environmental karma. If you haven't talked about much, 
The third one of the remedy purifies the, the, the lower the type of rebirth suffering. And the fourth one, the determination to not do it again, obviously purifies the tendency. You understand? Yep. Okay. Yes. My question has to do with suffering that is self-reflexing. Give an example. Um, so in my own mind, I struggle a lot with compulsive thinking that's really disruptive. Compulsive thinking. Compulsive thinking. You mean uncontrolled so, thoughts. Um, or on and on, yeah. bashing away at the same thing. Even in the way of the prayer. Did okay. I say it right? I, I okay, got it. Okay. okay. How do we purify something who's... If I'm the receiver and the actor, how do I purify? What do you mean by receiver and actor? I'm experiencing the suffering that I myself am causing. But that's exactly what suffering is in Buddhism. We are causing our own suffering. <laughs> how do I purify something when there's no obvious? I can't. I can't figure out the causation for it to purify. Uh, that's a good point. It's the habit. You see, what goes on in our mind? What goes on in our mind? as well as what we do with the body and speech on the basis of what's in the mind, because the mind's the boss, right? They're just habits. They're called habits. They're habits. So if you can see you've got a habit to be shouting and screaming every day, it's because you practice the habit. If your mind is, as you just said, as it was, that's a habit you've cultivated. If you're playing the piano, it's a habit you've cultivated. So the cause of it is the fact that you've done it before. You don't have to, you don't have to look and search underneath for some fundamental cause. It's simply the product of having been that way before. So if you can see that it's a suffering tendency, then you at least can identify it. Then we do our best to try and counteract it. There's always got to be antidotes to everything. So it's not, but it's not, sometimes other practices that don't seem related to it can also, certainly in the Buddhist world, other practices can be, that are not directly related to it, could also be a very powerful antidote. You know, if you've got a tendency to have uncontrolled speech, let's say, you might do another practice of, I mean, no, no that's, not, that's not the point. You, there's many ways that, okay. What have I said so far? Is it helpful or not? Moderately. Moderately. <laughs> I'm so happy it's moderate at least. <laughs> the fundamental thing about the mind that has is to have some confidence that it's possible to change it. Mm -hmm. Do you have that confidence? Yes. Then honey child, keep practicing, keep persevering. Mm -hmm. And that also means while we're still not getting the result of what we want, we learn to live with whatever the thing is. If you've broken your leg and you want it to go away, you do, but you know it's going to take six months. You, you're doing all the right things to heal it, but meanwhile, you've got to learn to live with the pain, don't you? Do you see my point? So we've got to see what our mental problems are, and we've all got mental problems, and we've got a million ways they manifest as well as our other problems. So we have to see them, try to identify them, know they don't determine, determine my reality. They're not my, they're not innate. Know that I can, by identifying them, I try to counteract them or learn to live with them while you're doing other things that'll help alleviate them. So it's just, it's, it's a lot, it takes a lot of courage because we freak out very easily about our own minds, I think. We wish it wasn't like this. We wonder why it's like this. We, you know, we, and we identify ourselves with those tendencies. How would you recommend, one of my bigger struggles is compulsion getting in the way of completing a commitment. So by compulsion, why don't you say a bit more what you mean by compulsion? Um, so if I do a visualization practice, it's, is this complete, is this correct? Did I do it enough? I can't complete the visualization that I'm trying to complete. So is that what you, you, you're just talking about? It seems to me you're describing a mind that's dissatisfied, that whatever you do, it's not right. That's not compulsive. Compulsive, that means, seven. so it's, it's definitely compulsive. Yeah, but I don't know. Look, everyone uses the word in a different way. So you've got a certain definition of it. So tell me your definition. Sure. My, my definition of compulsion in this way would be psychological DSM-5 diagnosis. So, of, sorry, sorry, what? Obsessive compulsive behavioral tendencies. Okay, so that's a term that's used yeah. in the West. Yes. And Okay, and, so then what, are the ten, what would be the symptoms of that mental illness? The, the symptoms would be usually negative, obsessive. Mental thoughts that lead to compulsive behavior. So obsessive mental thoughts. Give an obsessive. example. Obsessive thoughts that lead to compulsive behavior, which could still be maintaining a thought. For me, I've turned it virtuous. So it's a lot of like repetition of prayer, recitation of things, wishing someone well that's intrusive 
to, to behaviors. To, like, but you're just describing the Buddhist perspective, you're just describing one aspect of attachment, which one of the functions of attachment is a super, super busy mind. Okay. We either call it OCD or obsessive compulsive, sure. we have a variation of it. It's uncontrolled mind, sweetheart, mm -hmm. uncontrolled mind. And because you're trying to do a spiritual practice, you they say one of the signs of success at the beginning of our spiritual practice is we actually think we're getting worse. It's because you are aware of your mind petal. You're not getting worse. It's not getting, I'm not saying you're worse or not worse, but a compulsive is what attachment does. Obsessive, compulsive, these are all these words, you know? This is a function of attachment. Up and down, like yo-yo, bipolar, all these words, all the variations of this intensive. And what I'm hearing when you're saying it is actually one of the main functions of attachment, dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never satisfied. Did I do it right? This is that's dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction is also the source of why you eat 47 cakes because no matter how much you eat, you're never satisfied. Why your people jump on 22 boys every day, but manifest in different ways is dissatisfaction. You're just describing dissatisfaction. You've got this wish to do things well, which is a good quality. Mm -hmm. You've got an intelligent mind, you have a busy mind, honey child, you've got all the resources, and you're doing the best you can with it. It's brilliant. How do you balance that with commitment? If it what feels like commitment, if it feels like a commitment to practice isn't complete. So I tweet what what? If it feels like a commitment to practice is incomplete. So what you, you have to go into details here. What do you mean by um, commitment to practice? Sorry. Yeah. So if if my commitment is a specific visualization practice. So you decided right? just so or you've done this out of a practice, you've done it and you committed because of Lama, you took initiation or something. Oh. I'm just saying. Yes. Okay, good. You've got a commitment to do the practice. Yes. And you want to do the practice. Right. Great. Go on. What's the question? And making me emotional the good com the completion is yeah. very difficult what do you mean by the completion sweetheart not being able not being satisfied not with being the result to maintain a visualization in order to complete the practice sweetheart what do you mean by maintain a visualization let's just say you've got a tara practice and you set up the practice yeah. you've got your sadhana you visualize tara where's the incompletion i don't understand i can't keep the visualization in a way that I'm you mean can't keep it what for a second for a minute for a day what through, do you say through what the practice needs to be so for for 10 seconds like so even maintaining a visualization no, no, to I, bring it I mean, some people can't either can't visualize at all what, what's your yeah. name, please? So, please. Victoria. Victoria. Victoria, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Yeah. What I'm hearing is you've got this very busy mind, a very intelligent mind, a very devoted mind, a very committed mind. You really want to do well. You're doing fucking brilliantly, but you're never fucking satisfied. That's your disease. Join the universe, <laughs> Victoria. Are you really hearing me, Petal? You are doing so well to actually think you should visualize for 12 seconds. I mean, you're not satisfied with whatever you can do. The humility is you have to learn to be satisfied with what you can accomplish. That is what will cause you to get better. Are we communicating, Victoria? It's dissatisfaction that you're describing, which is the main pain of attachment. Are we communicating? Because where is it written that you should do it for 12 seconds or one or 40 seconds? It's just a thing you've set yourself up and then guaranteed to fail because you feel you can't complete it. This idea you have complete, complete. Complete is, it's a process. You do what you can. I'm not trying to make you just, I'm not trying to sort of pat, pat you on the shoulder. I'm trying to, it's a literal reality. You, it's like you are doing really well. You're doing your practice, it sounds to me. You're sincere, you want to do it. But you, this, is the, this is the hardest practice for us, but to learn to have the humility to be content with what you can do. Because it, it's sort of like you got to grade one. I'm only in grade one. Then you get to grade two, and you get to grade 947, you're still dissatisfied. So you got to, it's like a tricky thing of learning to be content this minute with however you are doing your practice. It's humility with yourself. If you're just being lazy and can't be bothered, that's different. But you're not being. You're being super committed. I can't stress this strong enough, Victoria. Are we communicating or not, do you think? And, and how do you get satisfaction? This is what's an interesting point, okay? Wow. My mother used to say, you're in your own worst enemy, Bobsy. And she's so right, you know. <laughs> Buddha says the same. So the thing is, we've got the senses and we have mental consciousness. So the sensory consciousness, which is involved in food, so you're not discussing food, you're discussing purely your mental consciousness. Food is no issue. It's no, no, I can see. So the, the sensory, so the sensory, so always like in my life attached to food. So naturally I would eat 
until my stomach was full because we would think that means satisfaction is because you know, you want the feeling of satisfaction because I didn't know how to think of it mentally but satisfaction is a mental state that won't come from you doing a perfect visualization. It will, it will come from you being content with what you can do and then training your mind, which is this is how you get satisfaction. I'm doing okay. Well done, Victoria. This is good for now. I'm okay. I'm doing good enough. You're not lying to yourself. You're practicing training your mind in being mentally satisfied with where you are at this second it's a tremendously powerful thing to practice and it's the the disease we all have in a multitude of ways not be i would hear it as that not being satisfied with your progress i mean am i miss am i not understanding what you're telling me can you hear me or not what do you think i mean you've got your very clear analysis of what you think it is from the western view i'm giving you the buddhist one Tell me what you're hearing. Yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And sometimes I, I feel that I'm I'm conflating or confused on what the appropriate practice is because I feel that I'm sorry, sorry, what do you mean by appropriate practice? Um, the appropriate practice. So should I I'm thinking it would be best for this mind to just practice shamatha and to not do visualization in that way and to just No, those. no, see that's no, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you why that's no good. You know, you've heard of Nundro. Mm -hmm. You know Nundro. That's like you go to Federer. And he looks at you and he sees you're 20 pounds overweight and you haven't got a clue what a tennis racket is. You know nothing about nutrition. And you say, please play, help show me how to play tennis, Roger. And he will say, go back for a whole year and go back and do some. He'll say, go and do your nundros. Mm -hmm. you, you want to go straight to start playing tennis, but you're not ready yet. Your mind isn't qualified. Mm -hmm. So sitting there doing bloody shamatha is like bashing away at a tennis racket when you're 20 pounds overweight. Mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to work on your mind by doing other practices like purification and prostrations and water bowls and mantras. They are so powerful and they will purify your mind. And then when you get to shamatha, you'll be able to do it more easily because you purified your mind. You've, you've prepared your mind. Now you can pick up the tennis racket and start playing tennis. Mm. But stop wanting perfection. That's all dissatisfaction is. Mm. It's wonderful to want it to be perfect. That's what wanting to be a Buddha is. You want to be perfect, but you've got to be content with each step of the way. It's a trick. Victoria, what do you think? Some useful information here or not? Small, medium, or large? Large. <laughs> really, sweetheart. Really, and please, I beg you, being satisfied is telling yourself what you are doing that's good. Mm. And it seems to me you're doing a pretty good job. I'm not trying just to praise you just to make you feel better. Do you understand me, sweetheart? Re that's what rejoicing means. It sounds so boring, rejoice. It is a profound practice. And it's humility with yourself. Jonathan, time to go home, is it? Time for birthday cake. <laughs> Three o'clock, one o'clock, of course, it's time for birthday cake. Come on. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to have it here. Um, I'll put it in and then we can't go downstairs. Okay, so we finish. I can't, I'm so sorry, we can't give you any birthday cake unless it's so advanced you can get the essence of it through <laughs> Zoom. All right. So maybe we'll wait for the cake comes and we can hang on a second, one second. We'll, we'll just dedicate thinking. Thank you, Victoria, for her example, because in a variation of ways we are identical. So please, can we try and rejoice in our efforts, rejoice in our virtues? And it means say the words to yourself. Delight in what we're doing, delight in our progress, delight. And know we have this marvelous potential to keep moving. And by delighting in our progress now, it gives us the encouragement to go to the next step. So we and then we never give up, never give up, never give up. Jung Chu, Sem Chu, Rinpoche, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gu Chi, Ke Panyam Pa, Me Panyam, Gomne Gondu Kova Shok. Okay, people, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, that's it. No need. Yeah, that's good. So. Where's the cake? Here we go. Come on here. Okay. You, have to, you can let the zoom and see the cake. Come here. It, it got, I don't know what happened on the transport, but. What happened? This looks like it's a little. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at that. It's, it's all broken into pieces. Oh. There we go, the cake. There's the cake. Show them the cake. 
It's a delicious chocolate cake. It it's got flowers, oh, it's flowers and purple flowers, and it's got a note on it. Happy, Happy being being reborn, reborn day. day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to enjoy cake now. So I'll say goodbye to you now. You just imagine you're getting the essence, all right? Thank you, Bina. Happy birthday. Thank, Thank you so much. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Have a slice Take. for me.